Assassin's Creed is my favourite gaming franchise of all time. My first entry was Assassin's Creed Brotherhood when I was 10, and ever since AC3, I have bought all the games on release date, sinking thousands of hours into Ubisoft's reenactments of historical landscapes, from the Third Crusade to Ancient Greece. And while the franchise has had many ups and downs, there's one thing that nearly every player I've met can agree on, Odyssey is the worst. But aside from that, it's that out of all the protagonists we've followed, in over 12 years of gaming, Italian nobleman Ezio Auditore da Firenze will always be the best, with the games he features in being the peak of the franchise. And whilst we aren't getting any new games anytime soon, the most recent update for Odyssey did feature Ezio's outfit for players, which shows interest in the character is still prevalent nine years after Ezio was seen on screen. And so today, I'm going to be doing a very different format from my typical movie essays, and suggesting my arguments for this very simple question. Why do we remember Ezio? Before we begin, there will be full spoilers for Assassin's Creed 2, Brotherhood, Revelations, and the short film's lineage and embers will also be touched upon. Also, please keep in mind that whilst Ezio is not my personal favourite protagonist, as stated in the beginning, I am still a massive fan of this franchise, so my opinion will factor into some of my points. However, I'm not here to talk about the games themselves, just the writing and presentation of the character which by the looks of this runtime is going to be quite in depth. I've spent three weeks writing this script, so please excuse any inconsistencies in the writing. But, since I'll be tackling everything chronologically, chapter times will be available in the comments section if you want to skip to a particular part of the video, as it can be quite a handful all in one go. Now without further ado, let's begin. Let's start by looking at Ezio's character design when we first meet him as a Florentine noble. From this initial character design, the first things I notice are his popped collar and loose sleeves that primarily focus you on his upper body. The popped collar gives him the typical appeal of a 90s cool kid, with the loose sleeves showing a more laid back personality, already telling us a lot about his character. As a rich 17 year old, Ezio mustn't have much to worry about, his father being a banker, means he doesn't particularly have any money problems, or needing to work, since life expectancy wasn't particularly high in the 1500s, averaging at around 30 to 40, so it wouldn't be long before Ezio inherited his father's job instead of having to go look for one. This already makes the player think of this character as one who isn't sure with who he wants to be, due to the lack of sincerity in his initial design. He wears his hair in a ponytail with curtains on each side, which emphasises his youth, and also resembles depictions of Romeo from Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet that appears a direct inspiration for the character's design. The curtains could also be taken directly from DiCaprio's version, playing into the Italian stereotype of being a romantic, with the ponytail to further show the player his lack of aspirations or ambition, to the point where he doesn't get his hair cut but simply ties it back. A clever detail to have, since the player will 99% of the time be looking at Ezio's back, his lower half is naturally a lot darker, in contrast with his pure and innocent whites and greens of his upper half. This could be intentional, since his trousers and boots carry over into the assassin robes, and so some subtle foreshadowing is in place. Overall, there's little to fault, the character design perfectly encapsulates a Florentine nobleman with materials that feel authentic and there are so many subtle foreshadows of what his costume would soon become that as a first impression of Ezio, it does a lot of the groundwork in establishing his character before we even meet him. It's important to note that this isn't how we first meet Ezio, however. We actually see his very birth. Ah! 
Sì, sì, brava! It is a boy. While the mother Maria comes across as a simple loving mother, to contrast her later oath of silence, it is Giovanni Auditoria that steals the show character-wise, by already implying his assassin roots, by being late to the birth and making a quick excuse, which always gave me the impression he was a father too wrapped up in the assassin lifestyle that his family were merely a cover story. Such a lifestyle is explored in the short film Lineage, which acts to set the pieces in motion and provide a bit of insight into Giovanni and his duality. And the reason I'm mentioning this in a video about Ezio is that Ezio himself does get a few small scenes where he is shown to have a good relationship with his family, but also that his father always wanted him to do great things, which builds on their relationship more than in the actual game. So it's some nice context, if a bit heavy handed. Why not? I need you to assist your brother. Take care of the family while I'm away. I want to help you, father. You're helping more than you know, Ezio. More than you know. The attention to detail given to the parents in this opening has external contrasts as well, and so I have to make a small detour to talk briefly about the first Assassin's Creed. One of the major complaints with AC1 was that its protagonist was a plank of wood, wearing the same costume as everyone else, giving him no real uniqueness except for an extremely out of place American accent. Altair ibn Lahad was raised under the assassins from birth as a mindless killing machine, which played into the game's themes of free will. However, it didn't much help in creating a likeable protagonist, and so it's clear that in the sequel, Ubisoft went all out at creating a character that would really stand out. And so, from the very beginning, Ezio's name is literally bellowed into our ears to rest our minds at ease that this will be a name to remember. This confidence carries over into Ezio himself. Whilst internally he seems very conflicted on who he wants to become, other than his given job at the bank. Clear character traits are established early on. We see he is violent and quick-tempered, although willing to defend his family's honour and also has a lot of people that support him, already showing leadership qualities that will emerge further as his journey continues. The events that follow showcase how Ezio feels towards his family, and also towards people that oppose his family, in a wider scale than the opening. We get a more fleshed out impression of the character from these interactions. Ezio is willing to help his younger brother catch feathers, if not to establish a later collectible, but to attach a gentle feather with the younger brother as a reflection of the innocence Ezio still has within him. The interaction with Duccio showcases Ezio's hypocritical views towards women. He calls a woman a whore before beating on the rich nobleman that used his sister Claudia in a similar manner. This is something further exemplified with Maria, stating Ezio only has interests in women sexually, and so his violent reaction towards Duccio may actually be because the two are quite alike, and Ezio is unable to see this. Instead, lashing out, which is something that contrasts with our initial impression from his design. It starts to unravel that Ezio is dangerously loyal to his family, and they may be bringing out the wrong side of his personality, but is still argumentative with them, which gives him some semblance of guilt when they're taken from him, and that he didn't appreciate them more. The opening hours of the game are meant to strengthen the player's attachment to Ezio and his family, which further impacts his statement at the beginning that it is a good life that he leads. Best, may it never change. And may it never change us. The line, may it never change us, is a huge bit of foreshadowing, but it gives us an insight into the mindset of the character. 
when things are going well, we have a tendency to want to pause that moment and stay in it forever. And so especially for returning players, it becomes painful that we, the player, push Ezio into this spiral of events and fundamentally change him. The player is as much a part of the character as Ezio himself, and Ubisoft want our actions to impact Ezio's, so that we feel partially responsible, and therefore, we'll seek revenge on the Order as much as Ezio does. The last note I have on these opening hours is the inclusion of Leonardo da Vinci, to act as a throughline for Ezio before and after his family are killed. We get to learn more about Ezio and how he has changed through how he acts towards Leonardo before and after. Before, he is respectful and polite, but after is more demanding and seeks help from him, however not as aggressively as they begin to build their friendship. As a key player both here and in Brotherhood, Leonardo is portrayed as an innocent and kind soul that only wishes to help. He is a genius and looks positively in most situations. In a way, he's one of the anchors keeping Ezio on the light side and provides some relief from the dark storyline. These small quests lead to the event in which Ezio's brother and father are taken to prison, and this is where the game's defining chapter begins. The following events set the remainder of the game in motion, and the repercussions it has on Ezio's character are felt right through to Revelations. Ezio is told to find his father's hidden room that contains his broken blade and assassin robes. Ezio attempts to clear his family's name until this happens. To pronounce you killed. You and your collaborators are hereby sentenced to death. You are a traitor, Roberto, and one of them. You may take our lives this day, but we will have yours in return, I swear we will! Father! Hey, grab the boy! He's one of them. I'll kill you for what you've done! Guards, arrest him! The theme of revenge is one that is incredibly simple, yet effective to fit a character like Ezio. He is purposefully built with this theme in mind, and it's one that follows him into Brotherhood and is for many people a weak aspect to Ezio's character. And yeah, it is overdone to death, but for this character it's clear that it needed to happen to get his nobleman lifestyle out the way in order to develop and humble the character before he came across as unlikable. The piercing of it feels natural because we know it needs to climax with something life shattering to propel the prologue into the actual game, it's just a matter of time. But the seeds are in place with Ezio's violence and relationship to established characters that we already get the impression who he is so that now the arc can begin. Now what makes video games have some of the best characters ever? Ugh, my voice. What makes video games have some of the best characters ever? Well one, the personal connection we feel controlling the character and two, the amount of time we control them for. When watching TV or movies, there isn't the choice to keep going. Video games can have us be the character for as long as we want and it'll never get old. People love characters like Master Chief, not because he's complex, but because he is us. Everything he's done that is so impressive, we can say we've done and feel proud, but also there's time to become more invested in the characters that we see for longer. Imagine having to craft an 11 hour story along with consistent side content all the way along that makes the piercing redundant and the flow of your story different for every player. That is why it is so crucial to have a slow build up so the principles of the character are clear and in the back of our heads for the entire game. Ezio has the vivid image of his family being murdered to sit in our minds. There are visual motifs in place throughout to remind us of Ezio's motivation. The feathers remind us of innocent Petruchio, and how Maria is in shock from his death. The suit you wear is not yours, it's Giovanni's, and so we have this visual reminder that you are finishing something you didn't start. And let's talk about that costume. This is Ezio's first proper suit, and he wears it for almost the entire game, so you become incredibly familiar with the design. Assassin's Creed 1 featured bright white suit that fit practically to reflect the burning sun in the Middle East and heat. 
but realistically did not serve a master of stealth all too well when you're the first thing people see. Here, however, the design makes thematic sense. The white represents nobility and flamboyancy. The theatrical is definitely taken into account with the design, as if Ubisoft knew they would be stuck with white and thought to build a character that would wear it and why. The cape, the loose sleeves, the smirk on his face tells you everything. You need to know that this game will have more fun, and that Ezio as a character will have more fun once his assassin ropes are donned. However, the revenge aspect of the story means he is a bit stubborn and serious, but eventually the promise of the game's box art shows itself as late 2000s age. The costume uses red like a flirtatious throwing down of the gauntlet, almost asking people to oppose him, to challenge him. His passion and violence are expressed through the one colour, now a primary colour aside from Altair's Mia belt. I should still point out I do love Altair's outfit, but it's going for something very different than Ezio's, and doesn't present as much character. Which in Altair's case is the point, but anyway. The most important part of this design is that it doesn't take anything away from the nobleman costume, it simply adds on top of it. The popped collar, the pointed boots, they're all still there, but now the costume is jagged and triangular to show Ezio as a true threat. In preparation for this video, I bought the Assassin's Creed Visual History, which is a guide showing the artwork from all the games from Assassin's Creed 1 to Syndicate, and it's helped massively in defining uh, characteristics for Ezio and specifically the costumes. Now, when looking at the Assassin's Creed 2 segment, I do want to read out a little quote to give you an idea uh, what the devs were thinking at the time. It goes, The earliest conceptions for the Italian assassin were exciting and dramatic, but felt too far away from that invisible sense of what fit within the franchise. Additional explorations abandoned the clean bright white of an eagle and instead used the crow as a much bleaker animal totem. One of the first mistakes I made in the beginning was going for something very dark. We talked about changing the symbol of an eagle to something different, like a crow, but we found that it went too far in the other direction, with the crow representing death and poison, so we threw away that idea. The art team even actively tried to move away from the hood, an idea that would gain ground in later instalments, but in the early life of the franchise it was clear the hood still needed to become part of the assassin's identity. Now I'll be referring to the visual history a few more times in this video, but for now you can get an impression just how much work they had to go through in order for the devs to really, uh, you know, build the character of Ezio. At the time they had to make the design, there was no gameplay, none of the side missions were actually planned out. They didn't even know what the story would be, they just had the concept of an Italian assassin and this is where their minds naturally went and that helps massively because it's where the player's mind will also go so that kind of instinctive response is why I think the Assassin's Creed 2 robes are so iconic is because they are exactly what you think about when you say Italian Assassin. Now I know I'm bouncing back and forth, but I really want to mention the music in this game and how it complements Ezio as a character. Now I'm no musician, but I can try to see the intention behind some of these tracks. The most important being Ezio's family, the one everyone and their grandma has heard of, since it's been reused so much now that it's become the main theme for Assassin's Creed. But what does it mean for the character it was meant for? Ezio's family, whilst not actually being the main theme of the game, does describe Ezio's journey throughout. The track feels powerful and works in two different ways, 
before and after the hanging. Beforehand, you can hear innocence and calm, a happy, peaceful time, which slowly twists into conspiracy and a hidden, underlying mystery. The singing contorts into something more haunting, found more intensely in other tracks, but here just enough to imply the danger. The song is not only Ezio's family before, a happy and content group, but after, broken and betrayed seeking vengeance. The track escalates to show us the pain of losing his family and how it twists Ezio into seeking justice and losing his innocence, uncovering the larger mystery at hand that was hidden from him and rising above that. He didn't want to be an assassin. None of the protagonists in these games want the path they're given. It's tragedy and betrayal that lead them to going on this crusade. And that theme found throughout the games is why this track has appeared so many times, because of its appropriation. When the song is at its peak, it quickly fades. His anger has simmered down and Ezio regains composure. He has brought them to justice, but to what end? After all that's happened, do you think he would have shown either of us such kindness? You are not Fieri. Do not become him. With Ezio's family being hung in front of him, his arc can finally begin. To find the people responsible amongst a growing conspiracy and clear his family's name. His uncle Mario provides Ezio with a father figure, despite not being in the game too much, which thankfully lets Ezio become a more active protagonist. These are the first steps in Ezio uncovering the conspiracy, not out of revenge, but to fulfil the prophecy. I'm going to ignore that prophecy for now and come back to it later, because unfortunately it is quite destructive towards Ezio's character. An interesting note I picked up on during my most recent playthrough was the theme used for Christina, the girl Ezio hooks up with in the opening, that will absolutely be discussed more when we get to Brotherhood. But her theme I equated to simply a lovey-dovey theme, however, it makes a strange reoccurrence immediately after Ezio returns to the brothel after killing Alberto. And it's not the brothel's theme by the way, it is a completely different track. The theme is brought up several times more in Brotherhood, and on the Jesper Kid Best Of soundtrack, it's credited as Ezio and Katarina, who is the love interest in Brotherhood. However, I think this theme, whilst romantic-ish, is honestly very painful to listen to. screams tragedy, and I feel like that's what this theme really represents. The things Ezio cannot have. It needs a bit of work, but what I mean by that is, Ezio doesn't realise yet that he can no longer have love. After he kills Alberto, he realises he has not gotten justice or content. Here is where he realises what he's gotten himself in for. Ezio rushes into this cause so quickly, and kills Alberto so soon, that he can no longer escape. And so it all becomes clear why Giovanni never told Ezio about his heritage. It was to save him, so he could live a normal life for as long as possible, until the day came he must take over from his father. It's a tragedy that Ezio's life was so content, but it was never going to stay the same whether his family were killed or not. I genuinely don't know how people can talk for this long. Oh my god, right. With each of Ezio's targets eliminated, he begins to mature. We see him develop his people's skills beyond that of stubbornness and naivety. He slows down and appreciates other people's opinions and learns to build up an assassin brotherhood. This arc improves over Altair's massively, since the lessons he learned seem to be just simple justification for why the assassins do what they do, with philosophical dialogue thrown in to cover up the fact the main character does not have a narrative reason to change other than the plot needs him to over time, through the repetition of tasks. Wow, that really sounded like I heard Altair. <laughs> Look. I don't, I don't hate Altair, but you know what, you know what, it's fine, I don't hate him, I don't hate him, I love the suit, I love the suit, I don't, I, I mean, I mean, sometimes he can be a little bit irritating. I have no interest in the treasure. I've never had a single problem with Altair, it's Altair. Altair. Son of Omar. 
you know what? Let's just carry on. Let's just... Let's just carry on. Ezio, on the other hand, has different gameplay mechanics show his development. He metaphorically can't reach a new ledge, so he receives guidance on how to physically reach it. He viewed women as objects of pleasure, so they teach him how to take advantage of that to blend into your surroundings. His character has a natural progression, as he rallies everyone to his side. And there really isn't much more subtlety than that, it's just a well-crafted way of creating an arc that's simple but effective due to the execution, over the course of the game, which spans years of Ezio's life. During this time, we hear him mature, his voice deepens, his words slow, and more thought is taken. He even grows a beard, until the same nobleman we saw at the beginning is nearly unrecognisable, if not for the armour his father left for him. Throughout the course of the game, there are these massive dungeons in the form of the Assassin Seal missions that unlock Altair's armour. I like to view this as you proving yourself to the game so that Ezio can grow out of his father's robes and earn his own. When the armour of Altair is obtained, it sums up Ezio's entire arc through visuals alone. It is black, with more longer drapes over the front, making it look slower to move in. He's no longer the youthful and pure character, but a matured, silent one. He listens to people, respects different cultures and upbringings, and yet the little white that is left show Ezio still has a sense of humour and will not forget where he came from, but has now reached his full potential. Or has he? The reveal of the reason Ezio's family was killed is where the worst plot device in history is implemented. According to an undisclosed prophecy devised only to move the plot along, decree that Ezio will deliver a message to the modern day protagonist. And then there's weird future aliens, blah blah blah. The only importance it brings to Ezio's character is the implementation that he was destined to go on this arc, and that he did not do it out of his own free will, but that Ezio was being guided to the right place at the right time so that he could infiltrate the Vatican and punch the Pope. A clever trick, but useless. This does numb Ezio's character development somewhat, however what's important is that it did happen despite the prophecy, and really, for the game to pull a Destiny gimmick out at the last act is pretty poor, and doesn't seem to fit with the arc they were building. However, this does go somewhere interesting in the future instalment, but that's where Assassin's Creed 2 leaves us, with a team of assassins and a completed journey. So where could Ezio go next? Well, if Assassin's Creed 2 was Batman Begins, then Brotherhood was the Dark Knight. Now what do I mean by that? Well, it's kind of like how the Dark Knight isn't about Batman that much. Sure, he has an arc, he's the protagonist, but it's kind of like watching a Batman in his prime take on a colossal threat without worrying about getting him from one place to another, but instead just letting Batman's arc respond to Joker's actions until it reaches its conclusion. Well, there you have Ezio in Brotherhood. Ezio is a prophet that has fulfilled his duty, and now the game asks, what happens next? Well, it's simple. The fallout of his previous mistakes comes back to blow up his house. But I'm getting ahead of myself. There's a fantastic first few hours to the game that puts Ezio in a state of calm after decades of hunting the Templar Order. His mission is complete. Destiny fulfilled, he begins to settle down and look towards the things he is now free to do. He turns to a relationship with Katarina and helps the people of Monteregioni with simple errands. The dialogue here, I mean it isn't exactly subtle, but it's nice to see Ezio in a normal environment and how friendly and respectful he is. 
He wants to be a good leader and enjoy the rest of his life. He's looking forward to an easy life now that his father and brothers have been avenged. Ezio appears more likeable than ever through his kind actions and flirtatious attitude that reflects his younger self, and yet the looming threat of something going wrong is felt throughout, and we know this piece is all too good to be true. I have to find Mario and rally the troops. My men are in the courtyard. I aim to lead them around back and flank our attackers. Stay out of sight. When vengeance consumed Ezio, he lashed out. You are right to fear me. But eventually he spared the man that was responsible, and now that man is consumed by vengeance. Brotherhood asks the question, was Ezio's arc in two the right thing? Or should he have finished the Templars when he had the chance? Cesare symbolises the man Ezio was. The man that would have killed the Pope. And Jesus, he even does. Cesare is Ezio's Joker. The one who lashes out and kills Mario as an act of war. Destroys the armour of Altair, the symbol of a matured Ezio. And destroys the Brotherhood, so that he must build it back up for himself. Brotherhood is a blockbuster that tells the story of a defeated man proving himself as a leader to build an army against his own mistakes, whilst maintaining his inner circle of friends that acted as his voice of reason, with the roles now reversed. Ezio's armour this time is that of a Roman master assassin, a very rectangular design compared to the previous, but he wears the same armour as everyone else. He puts himself alongside the other assassins and says that he is willing to regain the image of his younger self in order to build himself back up, because he's already the confident man he needs to be to do it. Whereas Cesare acts out of paranoia and madness, Ezio is calm and collected. Square level headed like his outfit, he wears white because he wants Cesare to see him coming this time. Ezio takes on more of a Optimus Prime kind of role here, eBay. being a stoic leader but with the same humour and charm that makes him work. He still feels like the same character from 2. Much like Ezio himself, the game refined a lot of mechanics from 2, including a chain kill, which means that you, the player, feel like Ezio is improved now with the ability to disperse foes quicker. He feels more like a one-man army, but as you build up your team of assassins and see Ezio start to become more of a mentor, then it becomes more clear Ezio's arc in this game. If Assassin's Creed 2 displayed Ezio learning from his friends and building them into a brotherhood, then his arc in brotherhood is learning to work with them, and become the leader they believed he was destined to be. His involvement with the prophecy is quickly swept under the rug, and the characters just shrug it off and focus on what would happen next. Ezio, however, has already gone on this life-changing journey in the last game, so his character doesn't develop too much further, apart from him becoming a leader. There's an argument to be made whether Ezio needed another game, or whether his arc was completed in two. I think many of the AC characters didn't get games that deserved it a lot more than Ezio. They certainly could have left Ezio there. Characters like Arno or Bayek feel like they had a lot more to offer, but got cut off too early. Brotherhood does make Ezio feel like a badass, but because the player has been with him the whole time, it does feel like a natural next step. It doesn't develop to the extent of two, but it does enough to not feel like a rehash. Brotherhood reinforces Ezio's relationship to his family, lost towards the end of two, with the inclusion of Claudia as the leader of the brothel, which puts her right in the middle of this war, an action Ezio naturally disagrees with, as he wants to keep his sister safe after what the family have gone through. She, however, has already progressed to no longer depend on Ezio and be a strong female protagonist. She doesn't need Ezio to take care of her problems, defending her new home against the Borgia and make them suffer for what they've done. Joining the Brotherhood and allowing Ezio to become less protective of his family and recover from their trauma, Maria also acts as the voice of reason, setting Ezio on the right path when he disagrees with his sister's actions. After Ezio collected all the feathers for her, she broke her silence and has begun to recover, playing an important part in bringing this broken family back together. As the game progresses, Ezio must question the loyalty of his fellow assassins, 
with internal conflict between La Volpe and Machiavelli. I also know he abandoned you right before the villa attack. Machiavelli may not please all tastes, but he is an assassin, not a traitor. I am not convinced. Meaning that Ezio must pull through as the leader, taking his time to uncover the true identity of the traitor in their guild, rather than lean into vengeance that once clouded him, which would have resulted in the death of an innocent Machiavelli, but instead of lashing out, he listens, compromises and eventually gains the trust of his allies, which is contrasted with Cesare's crumbling support after he poisons his father and betrays his sister, as Ezio leaves him vulnerable, severing his support from the French. Why do you cry? They're going to take my mum on a boat ride. They say I will go on the next one. Who? The man from the castle came with guards and arrested us. He scared me. They are scary. But you look very brave. The finale of the game puts Ezio head to head with Cesare, fixing his mistake of leaving Rodrigo alive and fully finishing the order by leaving Cesare's fate in the hands of gravity because Ezio still can't bring himself to let vengeance consume him. And so, in a blaze of glory, he concludes his story. However, that's nowhere near the end of Ezio's progression in this game. The biggest addition to Ezio's character are by far the Christina missions that are littered throughout Ezio's time in Assassin's Creed 2 and fill in many of the details that the previous game passed over. I will go over these mission by mission and deduce what they do for Ezio's character. Mission 1 is called A Second Chance, and is set before the events of 2, and further builds upon Ezio's relationship with his brother and Christina, who was very briefly seen in 2, but now gets more of a setup leading into 2. Federico is shown to be more playful with his little brother and his knowledge of women show where his attention is focused, and explains how Ezio gains such similar traits. However, we see here a less confident side Ezio, being shy and nervous around Christina, and this gives us further insight in Ezio at his least confident. Contrasted by being in a game where he's arguably at his most, these missions serve better with prior knowledge than if they were included into AC2. We see Ezio as a bit of a stalker, which is a trait associated with introverts, and as the mission goes on, he comes out of his shell more when he defends Christina against another guy. When Ezio wins Christina's affection, he gives a rather goofy but charming smile that makes you feel quite happy for him, despite knowing what happens to Ezio next. It's just another thing that builds Ezio as a more likeable character, but adds further context to AC2. Ezio wasn't always a ladies' man as much as his mother may have suggested. He worked hard to win the only girl that would ever sleep with him up until that point, his lack of confidence being a major factor in this. Mission 2, Last Rites, shows Ezio and Christina taking the bodies of Frederico, Giovanni and Petruccio and burying them at sea. Something only hinted at in AC2 and something incredibly important to Ezio's character, we see the last interaction he has with them. His fond farewell, a calm in between his rage, the very moment he snaps and Christina is alongside him. This mission tells us more than anything that Ezio had someone by his side to ease his pain, which could be why he doesn't snap entirely due to Christina anchoring him. It's a great moment that could have been included in AC2, but the knowledge that this is the turning point for Ezio losing his innocence hits harder knowing her support cannot be there for much longer. As I spoke about earlier, the Romeo and Juliet references come front and centre, since these two are now being forced apart by destiny. Mission 3, Best Man, has Ezio return to Florence two years after he was forced to leave to protect his mother and sister. We now see him visit Christina, immediately showing that even with that much time passing, Ezio is still clinging to his childhood sweetheart. It adds more layers to Ezio, Many times in Assassin's Creed, love is completely missing from certain characters, and it takes away a lot of their humanity. It's a large part of what makes us human, is our attraction and relationship to others, and it's why characters like Connor are not as well liked. However, with Ezio, it's given more depth, by there being two sides to his love, what everyone else sees and what he sees. Everyone Ezio meets calls him a ladies man, but now we get to see the truth. In secret, Ezio had found the one, the one he was fighting to hold on to, 
even when he had to leave. This mission shows brilliantly, as Ezio has already run out of time. She has already been married off, and Ezio has to save the man that he must instinctively hate, only to find that he's almost a better man than he, and an ideal husband. Which is so heart-wrenching, because we want Ezio to be the hero and get the girl, but Ezio's tragic tale cannot allow it. His character is too far gone, and the writers openly admit that a murderer cannot have a normal life, and so he is forced to let her be. Mission 4, Persona Non... That one, takes place during one of the major set pieces in AC2, being the carnival, neatly tying in an interaction between Ezio and Christina, which only really serves the purpose of putting Ezio and Christina on bad terms for what happens next. Whilst Ezio never lost his feelings for her, Christina certainly did. She moved on from Ezio and lived a normal life, which brings up the idea of obsession and naivety as parallels can be made to Ezio's role as an assassin, and the amount of commitment it must take to go further and further into this cult-like creed. This mission answers that small hole by acknowledging Ezio as an obsessive character which leads perfectly into the consequences of Mission 5. The title of this concluding chapter, Love's Labour's Lost, is named after the early comedy written by Shakespeare, revolving around young men that vow not to engage with women, that find themselves surrounded by them and inevitably falling for them. It's a comedy about young love, so why is this mission named after it? Well, I believe it's irony. Purposefully contrasting the events of the mission, Ezio does not get his love, it instead gets pulled away from him. I cannot emphasise enough that these Christina missions take place over decades, and Ezio's mindset never changes, so this final mission forces him to make that change by killing off that part of his life. Ezio stumbles upon Christina's husband being killed and rushes to find and save Christina, but it's too late. I'll get you to a doctor. You're going to be all right. No, Ezio. I don't think I am. No! Don't go. Stay with me, Christina. Ezio, don't you know? I've always been with you. I wish we could have had a second chance. My love. This sums up the themes of this story perfectly, in a horribly tragic moment that brings the connection of Romeo and Juliet back to the forefront. However, Ezio has to live with this. The last spark of Ezio's youth extinguished, his commitment to Christina was useless, all of these missions show us Ezio's pursuits for a normal life, despite his illegal actions. It gives us the sad impression that if Ezio stayed away from his destiny, maybe he could have lived happily forever. If only he got that second chance. And so we leave Brotherhood, Ezio having defeated the ghosts of his younger self's mistakes, bringing together a Brotherhood to stand for the creed he now believes in, and leaving behind any semblance of a normal life it's here we skip ahead to the furthest yet, to a very different Ezio. The weary traveller begins his final journey in search of wisdom. After leaving Rome twelve months ago, Ezio leaves his brotherhood behind in search of Altair's great library at Masiaf. The legend of his codex pages are now a distant memory, and Ezio seeks to learn all that Altair did in his lifetime, 
fully embracing of his creed, and too late to get his happy ending, the crossroads of the world await in the concluding chapter of Ezio's saga. By the end of Brotherhood, Ezio was certainly getting up there in age, but unlike AC2, his character model remained the same, so it was difficult to see the time span the game took place over. However, it was eight years, and in his final appearance placing the apple in the Colosseum, Ezio was 48, but didn't look any different from the end of AC2. Where Brotherhood had shied away from addressing Ezio's age, Revelations takes full advantage of it. It may be a common trend now to age up characters with their audience, in order to feel a sense of nostalgia, there was a time when characters would remain timeless. There are of course many advantages to keeping your character looking the same, for example brand recognition. If you can recognise a character purely based on their silhouette, then chances are you've got a good character design. Assassin's Creed doesn't have this issue, since every character has the same iconographies, so they are easily recognised. Let's use the example of Mario. No, not that one. The Nintendo character, Mario Mario. One of the most recognisable fictional characters of all time, he's most recognisable by his overalls and bushy moustache. Not to mention his large red hat with a signature M. If they were to do a Mario origin game and show us a teenage Mario, what would they need to change? For starters, take away the moustache. Could probably keep the hat. Mario's design is so simple that taking away a key component like that could throw the audience completely. I think you get what I'm trying to say. Certain characters are designed so well that changing anything about them would just ruin their appeal. Mario has looked the same in every game, besides obvious new power-ups and gimmicks. Now here's how Assassin's Creed works so well for this concept. Ezio is a character people recognise from his iconic stance with the two blades out showing a cocky attitude and charm. His beaked hood and red belt with the large assassin buckle is also iconic, and his Italian robes fit the time period, and tells players where they will be travelling to, whereas nowadays, the box art will feature the whole country squashed into one image. Despite this, and Assassin's Creed franchise has always been identified through its character design and less the world, since it's constantly changing, so the through line has to be the beaked hood and hidden blade, otherwise it loses its identity. Revelations, however, gives a good demonstration of how the character design can complement the story, since a lot of Ezio's new design barely resembles his previous looks, and he could easily be mistaken for a new character. This must be intentional to further emphasise how far Ezio has came. The new outfit does a lot of the talking for him. Now I'm going to be biased and say that this is my favourite look for Ezio, but it wasn't always, and allow me to explain. I played the games in this order. AC Brotherhood, then 2 and Revelations I bought together much later down the line in order to catch up. Even then, I played AC 1 that came free with Revelations more, and I enjoyed it more. For a 13 year old riding the hype for Unity... Hello guys, it's Pixel Knight here, and as you can see by the title, today we are doing 5 things that Unity did right. Revelations was the least interesting for me solely down to Ezio's design, and how it contrasted with the gameplay. Trailers showed Ezio as a now wise old man, a very far cry from how everybody remembered the character. However, the gameplay hadn't changed. He still ran just as fast, just as high, despite how the dialogue in the game will try to tell you otherwise, I felt like I was playing as the same character that hadn't changed at all, and that didn't make sense. An aged up assassin just didn't appeal to me because I would rather play as a character that fit their animations. So what changed my mind? Well, in preparation for this video, I bought the Ezio collection, and I've been writing each segment of this study as I play it. At this moment, I'm halfway through Revelations, and can't see progression in terms of Ezio's character. He's being treated like a rookie by Yusuf, getting several tutorials and hand-holding around the city. All very negative, I'm sure, but then I notice something in the dialogue. Ezio doesn't seem to enjoy these tutorials. In one particular cutscene, he seems to want to snap back at Yusuf, but decides to stay quiet and allow him to continue. Ezio wants to stay young. Yeah, I bet you could have seen that a mile off, but... And so did I, but... 
It's when I saw actual evidence of it, I screamed hallelujah, I have something to talk about. Ezio is still Ezio. This statement is huge, Ezio is past his prime, but he is a cocky, big-headed Italian nobleman that has learned how to be humble and has gained stubbornness from his year alone travelling and refuses to let up. He's too old to settle down, too weary to continue, but the player keeps pushing him forward. We've watched him grow so much, he still needs to parkour, fight, kill, his identity is all lost, his robes are dark, and have completely lost their youthful energy. He's truly cloaked in darkness like a mystery we wish to uncover, but we the player are in on it. We know every story this man would have to tell. We share his wisdom, so both the character and the player go seeking more. We don't climb rooftops for feathers, we gain books. The major theme of this game is respecting the past more than any AC game has ever been. It's a thank you for sticking the journey out. Here's a fond farewell to this era of the franchise. We'll have the epic chases, the assassinations, the combat, but you know eventually it'll lead to that library. A ticking timer before Ezio's life gets snuffed, and this sense of finality the game excels at because it trusts that you've been there for the ride and you get to see it end. I didn't like Revelations because I didn't look at the weight it carried. AC games these days focus on spectacle, big open worlds, lots of quests and immersion, that it sometimes forgets that character can be more massive than any open world ever could be. The game still has a quick pace to it, but Ezio contrasts this by speaking slower and more tired. There's an underlying bitterness that he can't have what others do. Yusuf represents the man Ezio used to be, Sophia the woman he wants to be. Wait. No. Sophia is young but intellectual. She has used her rich upbringing for the good of others, which is everything Ezio should have done, but didn't. He can't go back and change that, it's done. You can't go back and replay AC2 with the knowledge, it's too late. Ezio made his decision years ago, when he chose to seek revenge and now he has come to fully regret that decision, but isn't fully willing to let his age stop him from enjoying the path he was sent on. That's what I feel Revelations is ultimately about. Moving on and letting go. Ezio stayed in Rome for three years after Brotherhood, seemingly with no opposition, and in his boredom left to explore the world. M m well, maybe boredom isn't the right word, more like an unwillingness to let go of the Brotherhood he built up. Ezio lost so much in his life that he has attachment issues, but he did leave. The whole cast of the previous games left behind. This is more a character piece than Ezio, about Ezio than his wider story, much like Logan does by excluding the X-Men. The game spans three years, which I believe is the shortest in the franchise, and it heavily contrasts with the decade spanning AC2, but it complements the mindset of our protagonist. Ezio's spur for vengeance took him down a spiral he couldn't see a way out of. By the time you the player finish the game and stop to regain your thoughts on what to do next, you realise that you've just taken a huge chunk out of this man's lifespan to achieve ultimately nothing. And then, a further eight years must be wasted to stop the Borgia, and here we are, Ezio finally having the time to do what he wants, and so he clings on at least small three years to do as much as possible. Judging by his robes, we can already see what he got done in 12 months. This is intelligent blending between the story and the character. It's only when you look at the timeline of these games and see how we get less and less each time with Ezio that we realise how strong the bond to him has been. His story is nearly over. We were surprised to see him again and again, everyone asking when AC3 will come out that when it finally did come out and we moved on, people didn't want to. People still yearn for Ezio to come back to this day because we barely see much of a time frame in Revelations that it feels unfinished. Ezio is now a mentor. He's older than his father could have ever been, but surely that should invite a globe-trotting epic, the last odyssey of Ezio Auditoria fighting the Templars till his dying breath. Well, sorry to disappoint, but this is where you as the player leave him. You collect the keys and find the library only to find it's completely empty. I mentioned Altair briefly back at the beginning, but the expert intertwining of the two warrants a brief catch-up. Altair was not given a choice for his upbringing. He followed a cycle. His father was an assassin, so was he. When given the Apple of Eden, a metaphorical symbol of free will, he chooses to burn his mentor's vision of the creed and run away. 
Yes, he was exiled, but the apple gave him enlightenment and made him see there was more to life than the assassins. He had a son, a wife that was tragically struck down. He lived in mourning for years before accepting his role in the Brotherhood once more. Returning the assassins to glory, spreading them out amongst the globe and dying alone in the ruins of his castle, so that his son could go home and live his life. The life that he never could. The life that Ezio never could. Ezio takes off his braces, his weapons unsheathed. He understands Altair's true wisdom as not some technology or weapon. The apple taught him to live his life. Simple as that. The words, nothing is true, everything is permitted, have had many different interpretations across the series, but here they represent the cause being a lie. The assassins and Templars, the ones who came before, these gods, none of them are true, none of them are important. You decide what's permitted, everything is open to you, live your life how you want because the conflict will never end at your generation. Live your life as you see fit. Yes, there will be consequences, but it's your free will to choose. Remember when I said that Ezio having a destiny in Creed 2 ruined his character? Well, look at Revelations. Sweep all that under the rug and give it a perfect counter-argument. A young Altair foresaw a prophet. A young Ezio became it. Both men, now old and having wasted a lifetime, devoted to a cause they didn't achieve an inch of progress in, leave with the same message to future generations. It's not worth it. Every game that came out since, those were the words echoing in my head for each of the characters. Please, turn around, walk away because it won't end with you. It's not worth it. And the longer the franchise keeps going, the longer that nail will be hammered in. What a beautiful ending to a game and to a character. At its heart, there's something so sophisticated with revelations in its approach to storytelling within the largest possible constraints that I can only give it praise for how well realised the closing moments of the game are. It's exactly what fans wanted to see in the opposite way of how we wanted to see it. Ezio and Altair meet with their actual thematic reasoning. Ezio retires to go get his happy ending. It's about time. And the best part? It's still not over. See, you thought I was going to move on to Embers, but I am actually going to talk about the soundtrack. <laughs> Revelations was composed by both Lorne Balfe and Jesper Kidd, which means it's a great transition from the Renaissance games into the American Revolution, with the brass horns and epic suites being subtly introduced, but lending themselves fantastically to Ezio's final chapter, making it feel more epic whilst leading us into Desmond's even bigger finale in the next game. Let's be honest here, Revelations is made by the music in every aspect. Hard-hitting moments bring you to tears with the right music, and this is so rapidly different from any soundtrack before it. I would describe it as mature, like we're past the cartoonish brawls with the Pope. The soundtrack reflects the harsh emotion of an older man who has seen so much. It's like a reflection of his memories, and they aren't good. The road is long and cruel, and a tragedy, always underlying in previous games, but revelations will make you feel sorry for Ezio, his time is up. The angelic voice accompanying the opening cinematic is absolutely magnificent. escalating further and further until taking a sharp jolt back to remind you that this isn't over. What a tremendous score. 
From the exotic tracks for Constantinople to the creepy and machine-like sounds for Altair, this may not be the most iconic soundtrack, but it sure is more suitable for the game it's in. Now you would expect Revelations to be the perfect end for Ezio, but Ubisoft went a whole step further with a gorgeously animated short film that depicts Ezio at his very end. When Chinese assassin Xiao Jun appears seeking guidance from Ezio, he is simply too old and weak to help her. Maybe in the past he would have shot off to China and killed everyone in his path, but here he can simply offer her the same advice he seeked from Altair. It's a bittersweet moment to see Ezio this frail, but especially in animation when you weren't able to skip it like a cutscene. If you were watching this short, it's because you cared enough to see it to the end, and it allows the short to spend time having Ezio do mundane tasks and simply relax and enjoy the little life he has left. He has had a decade since Revelations, and so did in some way get the normal life he seeked with Christina, but was far too late to fully enjoy it. When Xiao Jun brings conflict to the home, Ezio sends his family away and helps fend off the manor, but it's too much for him. He survives, but has exhausted himself to the point of it being fatal. Ezio is writing a note throughout this short, which ends up being his will to Sophia. A beautiful speech about how he wishes he could have had more time and the things he missed out on in his life are a sad note to end on for a character that brought such an energy but it's Xiao Jun that has helped him to this conclusion and thus has guaranteed him a legacy to be passed down in many different parts of the globe and throughout time. He dies where he was born, in front of the place where this journey began. This is where we performed the first leap of faith, and Frederico's words echo. It is a good life we lead, brother. <sighs> the best, may it never change. And may it never change us. Now his actual death is that of speculation, since a dude who screams Templar does give him some shifty looks and presses him on the shoulder, but I don't think that's important. The point is, he's a mirror image of Ezio. He dreams of Rome, somewhere and Ezio ended up going, so we can be reminded of the first two games. If you ever questioned why Ezio wrote his will as a message for his successors, well here's your reason, because dickheads like this will always exist. I like to believe that the attack on the villa was too much for Ezio, and caused him to suffer a heart attack, which ultimately caused his demise. But, the point being that a man who killed so many, could only die naturally. Like Cesare, that believed no man could murder him, Ezio has been left in the hands of fate. Maybe decades ago he could push his body further, but no longer. Time has caught up, and our hero passes. Before I give my conclusion, it's only appropriate to play the final words delivered by Ezio himself. When I was a young man, I had liberty, but I did not see it. I had time, but I did not know it. And I had love, but I did not feel it. Many decades would pass before I understood the meaning of all three. And now, in the twilight of my life, this understanding has passed into containment. Love, liberty, and time, once so disposable, are the fuels that drive me forward. And love, most especially, mio caro, for you, our children, our brothers and sisters, and for the vast and wonderful world that gave us life and keeps us guessing. Endless affection, Mio Sofia. Forever yours, Ezio Auditore. Nearly 10,000 words and very broken vocal cords later, here we are, my ultimate conclusion on why we remember Ezio as one of the greatest characters of all time. Assassin's Creed is renowned for its attention to story and character, from the comedic and energetic Friar twins to the thrill-seeking Edward Kenway, everything that made Assassin's Creed what it is 
boils down to Ezio. Ubisoft put in the time and effort to develop a single character from birth till death, showing everything in between with the maturity to show him as a three-dimensional character. The fantastic character design and world built around him excelled in defining who Ezio is, and Roger Craig Flippin Smith, I don't know how, but he did it. He managed to voice a 17 year old and a 65 year old and make it feel natural. The best way to truly show why Ezio is remembered is to show his legacy. There hasn't been a single assassin since him to appear in more than one game. The most we've ever been given is Arno and Evie that got a DLC sequel in the form of Jack the Ripper and Dead Kings, although I'd argue the latter is Marathon's better at development. There was for a time rumours of Bayek getting a trilogy that would take him from Egypt to Greece to Rome showing the origins of the Brotherhood and setting this grand stage. However, those seem to have been left to the wayside since whatever the fuck Odyssey was meant to be came out. What I'm trying to say is, it's about time and dedication. Ubisoft work very differently now to how they used to, whereas now games need to be huge. Kinda, kinda not RPGs with microtransactions littered throughout, plenty of copy-pasted mechanics and a thousand different collectibles. They used to be very experimental. Assassin's Creed 1 was a proof of concept that a spin-off from Prince of Persia could be more than that and hold up on its own as its own franchise. When Assassin's Creed 2 blew expectations out the water, Ubisoft panicked and changed direction completely on AC3 and in the meantime clinging to Ezio like their baby until it was time to let him go. These writers worked so hard to keep this character engaging and piggybacking off the previous, with more and more dated graphics and movement systems the players began to grow bored of, but the stories delivered so much to keep their investment high that now Ubisoft produced some of the best AAA games on the market. I know I just trash talked them, but I know I've just trash talked them, but God knows, I love AC Origins, with Watch Dogs and Rainbow Six being strong in their own rights, but none could possibly be unless Assassin's Creed gained the success it did. And it's all due to one Italian nobleman that redefined gaming as we know it. So thank you Ubisoft for giving the world Ezio Auditore. And thank you all for watching. Holy mother, this was a big one. But I couldn't have done it without the incredible support from my last video essay on Daredevil. I mean, Jesus, it reached 3.5k views. Like, look at my other videos. The highest I had until then was like 300, so getting 3k was absolutely incredible. It was featured in uh, websites, it was blowing up on Reddit. Absolutely incredible. So, in order to keep the standards up, I really wanted to create a big chunk of a video to give you something to really dig into and I, I hope I did all right. This is the first gaming analysis I've ever really done so I know it's it's going to be different compared to my film related media but if you want to see more like that, if you want me to cover more games then hit that like button and that'll inform me of such. Let's continue this discussion in the comments. I'm very excited to hear your personal favourite memories of Ezio, tell me what your favourite moments are with the character, what made you truly fall in love with him, don't use this video as a set standard, you know, if you have something that was my, you know, words out the water, go ahead, put it in the comments, let's, let's try and spread some positivity during such a horrible time. Thank you very much for watching everyone, and I'll see you in the next video.